Over seven million different animals inhabit our planet. It was dark and the animals were starting to wake up and the whole goal was that the data collection needed to start when the golden lion tamarins emerged from their nesting box for the day. What can they teach us? It is on the edges of where like tamarins really like to be. They are seeing some regrowth on the edges of the forest where they have been cleared and so these tamarins are there dispersing these seeds. Many species are in crisis and need your help. Join the movement at allcreaturespod.com. Welcome to the All Creatures Podcast. This is Chris. And I'm Angie. Angie, I think we're doing one of your favorites. One of your favorites from way back when. Oh, Chris, I have been dying to do the Golden Lion Tamron since we first started. I know. So... This is a very, very special pod for me, and I have my coffee right here. Uh, it's decaf because it's late. Um, <laughs> but that just goes to show how much I love these guys because I'm, I'm, I'm hitting the bottle hard, right, with my mm-hmm. decaf coffee. And Chris, the reason why I want everyone to fall in love with Golden Lion Tamarins today is because, well, they're super darn cute. They're basically like little lions mm-hmm. for the most part. And a, and a tamarind monkey form. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk more about their description, but I fell in love with them at the young age of 20, I must've been 21. Mm-hmm. And I had just graduated college and I found myself down in Atlanta, Georgia, living with my best friend, Nani, for the summer. Her and I were getting ready to backpack South America in the fall. She was finishing up a class and I was working in the summer, waiting tables, making money so I could travel. And the second morning I was there, she comes with this little flyer that says, looking for student volunteers to observe monkey behavior Mm -hmm. at the zoo. And I said, well, that sounds fantastic. That's right up my alley. And sure enough, when I got a hold of the researcher, uh, Molly, who was a PhD candidate at the time through Emory University, she told me all about the research I would be doing, collecting behavioral data, collecting fecal samples so she could measure their cortisol or stress. And then she told me when I would be collecting the data. Mm-hmm. And it was five mornings a week <laughs> from 5.30 a.m. till 8 a.m. <laughs> it's an early day for you. <laughs> uh, yes, and especially when I was waiting tables, working nights, right? Mm-hmm, so uh, mm-hmm. I think there was a few mornings. I, don't even, I didn't even go to bed. I think I just went straight mm-hmm. to the zoo. Uh, I was much younger back then. Yes, yes. So yes. yeah, but she, it, she thought it would scare me away, but it didn't at all. I was just super excited to be helping and learning how to collect behavior data and learning about, of course, primates and working at the Atlanta Zoo. So yeah. it was volunteer, so I didn't get paid, which was fine because I had the other job. And the coolest part about it, although it was so early, I had to arrive before sunrise. So it was very early, but it was so cool walking through the zoo and it was literally just the security guards and me. Nobody Mm -hmm. else was there at that time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it was dark and the animals were starting to wake up. And the whole goal was that the data collection needed to start when the golden lion tamarins emerged from their nesting box for the day. Because they would always wake up, come out of their box, and go to the bathroom. <laughs> kind of sounds like my husband, right? Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, they, and, I, and my job was to start observing their behavior and then also and to collect that first fecal dropping. So mm-hmm. that was my job. And that's what I did all summer. I think this was two minutes. Well, it was about five years ago, right? Yeah, it was, about, it was a long time ago. But... <laughs> It was, it was just magical, magical. My first experience being inside a zoo like that, working obviously as a volunteer, but still working you know, nonetheless, having a mentor guide me and teach me all about the scientific method and behavioral collection. And the coolest thing about these gold lion tamarins, and we'll talk a lot about when we get to their behavior today, but they're an arboreal species, so they live in trees. Mm-hmm. So Zoo Atlanta at the time was doing an awesome exhibit where it was a free range exhibit. Chris, it was so cool. It was just like a whole group of trees, maybe let's just say like 20 by 40 or something, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. probably bigger than that even, Uh, a a long stretch of trees. And there was nest boxes in there for the family of golden lion tamarins. And they just stayed in the trees in the middle of the zoo. Mm -hmm. And 
there was no fencing around them or anything. Right. And of course right. they had a building that they could be brought into if there was bad weather or something, you know, a big, maybe a big event going on at the zoo. But for the most part, they were just living in the trees in the middle of the zoo because they don't naturally go down to the ground. And so mm -hmm. the zoo was using this uh, as a way to let the golden lion tamarins have free range of this huge patch of trees. And of course, that's why it was important too to have observations on them. And they had cameras on them and things like that. They, it was obviously right, right, very right. safe for the animals. And then of course, interns like me collect collecting be behavioral data on their every move. So yeah, and I haven't been to Atlanta in many, many years, the Atlanta Zoo, and I need to get back there. I want to take the boys to the aquarium. I know they've done a lot of major awesome renovations since mm -hmm. I was there and John used to work there as well too. Mm -hmm. We, we crossed like ships in the night. Uh, mm -hmm. But I don't know if they still have that free range exhibit. I know they definitely still have gold line tamarins because it's one right. of their ambassador species. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're going to talk about their amazing conservation story today and how zoos help save them. So it's a, it's a hopeful day. That's why I've got my coffee, a big smile <laughs> on my face. Well, it's a, yeah. And it's, it started, you know, it's, it's amazing because I don't know. I, it just came up to me like, you know, this week, you know, one of our super fans, Quinn, and she sent us, 11-year-old Quinn sent us a, a nice picture drawing of a African painted dog that she was inspired to paint after listening to our oh, episode. I'm, oh, I loved it. Yeah. I know. And with the uh, lunar moth, she was just, you know, wings to protect them. And in there I wrote, you never know who's going to be the next Jane Goodall. And in, inspiring, you know, a young woman like yourself or a young girl like Quinn to make a difference in the world. And here you are, you know, a few years later oh, you know, you're with so your kind. PhD. <laughs> well, with the you know, PhD, you're reaching thousands of people around the world. So it's amazing that, you know, for the parents out there, you know, I'm just taking the Angie's story and Quinn's story and, and others. I, I think Chris wrote about his young daughter that listens to our, our podcast is inspired by it, that share this information with your kids. You know, they're the future. They're the future of this. And, and, and I love listening to your story because years later, you show up in my office, you do a PhD with me, a master's and a PhD, and you have me inspired, you know, that ripple effect. You know, oh, yeah, I you. got you out there collecting yeah. behavioral data on Somali wild ass. Remember? You did. You did. Yeah. I, yeah. And it changed my trajectory in my life. So it, it, great story, Angie. And, and again, you're right. Golden lion tamarins are a very special species you know, we're doing primates back to back and these are quite different than the gibbons that we talked about last week. So, you know, definitely stay tuned for some of that. Like Angie said, amazing conservation story because this species was almost extinct or driven to extinction. They're less than almost 2% of their native range is left in Brazil. And you and I talked and we really wanted to highlight a species in South America near the Amazon because of what's going on there. You know, that there is a major, major catastrophe happening in the Amazon rainforest. And so what's going on in the Amazon? You've seen it in the news and the Amazon is on fire. It absolutely is on fire. There, there, there are major, major patches of the Amazon burning right now today while we record this. And what it basically is, is large areas of dead forest that's burning. And what is happening down in the Amazon, and this is happening in Indonesia, you know, Southeast Asia happened in Africa is people are clearing these forests. They're going in with chainsaws. They are cutting down trees. They're let, letting them dry and then going in and setting them on fire to make way for cattle pastures and then the crops needed to feed cattle. And so these fires are huge. They're releasing tons of smoke and carbon in the atmosphere and they can't control them. And so it's got a lot of scientists that study this in an uproar because they're scared. I mean, because they are really seeing the Amazon, not only is there a huge drought down there, which is making the fires even worse, is they, they're afraid there's a tipping point where it's going to spin out of control and the Amazon's going to die off, you know, where then you're just going to have this big savanna left where there used to be this huge, huge rainforest. Now, some of the things that, that people are very upset about too is they had slowed down, I'd say in the last 10 years, last decade, of cutting down the Amazon rainforest. But with the new Brazilian president that came into office, he's implemented policies that's made it easier to, to clear out the forest. So it's accelerated again. 
So by the end of this year, they're estimating almost 10,000 square kilometers or 4,000 square miles of the Amazon rainforest will be cleared for ag, for agriculture, basically, is what is what it is. And it's just really, yeah, it's really un- well, scary. It's really unprecedented. There's been more than 72,000 fires reported this year, this year alone, mm-hmm. which is a significant increase from last year. There was about total last year, there was about 40,000 fires that were reported. Mm-hmm. So it's almost doubled and it's only, you know, not even three quarters of the way yeah. through the year. So it, yeah. it is just, it's unprecedented. And it is, I've saw, I've seen some graphics where it, it's like, well, what does this look like for us? And they show it pretty much all along Appalachia, like the Appalachian mountains are like, yeah, mm-hmm. it's like, that's the area. Imagine that mm-hmm, if you put mm-hmm. it all together, like that's all the area. Fire. Yeah. And so yeah. at the end of the pod, we're going to talk about what our audience can do to help and what, and what, mm-hmm. and some organizations that are really stepping up. And I get to talk about my boy, Leonardo. So stay tuned for that. <laughs> he's, he's not my boy, but I like to pretend. But Chris, it is, it is, it's depressing and it is something that, really needs to be highlighted and brought into our awareness because the Amazon is so precious. And the end of my golden lion Tamron story is that I got to observe the behavior multiple times per week each morning at Zoo Atlanta. And and the study was only going for about two to three months. And so the study ended. And by that time, my best friend and I were ready to backpack South America. And we spent about three months traveling throughout Venezuela, Brazil, Argentina, Chile, Peru, and Ecuador. And I got to see the Amazon. I got to go, I I got to spend time Mm -hmm. in Manaus, which that's more, that's like North Central, if you will. Uh, But the Amazon, the base of the Amazon's right there, the meeting of the waters. And it's just, I didn't spend enough time there. I wish I had more insight knowing how rapidly it was going to be depleted. I didn't get to see a lot of wildlife. I didn't go too far into the Amazon. Uh, I, d- I did get to see river dolphins, but I need to go back. And I want there to be an Amazon to go back to, obviously, for the animals. But then, of course, too, for tourists like us that care about green spaces and know how important the lungs of the earth is. I mean, that's what the Amazon is, lungs of the earth. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, and also... If I go back, I need to work on my Portuguese because that was one of the, <laughs> that was one of the main problems. Is our Spanish yeah, was yeah. fine, and so we were just naive, twenty one and naive, mm-hmm. like, oh, we'll be fine. We go to Brazil and speak Portuguese. Yeah, not so much. <laughs> it was really, it was really tough. No, no, so, no, no. But it was a special time, just being, just being in there and uh and and, mm-hmm. and seeing it. Yeah, and so yeah. I really would love to go back and see Gold Line Tamarins. You're right. And talking about all this, Angie, you know, the, the gold line tamarind, it is in the southeast corner of Brazil, which we'll get to here in a second. And before we get there, Angie, I just want to give a quick shout out to Jody and James, who joined us on Patreon this week. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Jody and James. Yay. I Make know. Sure it's request nice. some species. I know. I know. And it's just, you know, I was thinking about it. It's like one cup of quote unquote nice coffee from like a nice coffee boutique supports us. And supports conservation because we are giving back each month and we're about to send another check to an organization that our Patreon supporters get to vote on. So, you know, we're going to be doing that this week. We appreciate the support. We're really growing. It feels and, so and good. It feels I so know. good. I know. It is so great to to have fans and super fans that that help us, you know, get this message out there. Again, you know, you have Meerkat on there, Sperm Whale episode we just released a few weeks ago. You know, we're going to be coming up with a new species here pretty quick for them. Oh, I have a good one in mind. Remind me to tell you later. Okay. Okay. I'm excited to, to hear what that one is. And then just a couple other Instagram shout outs. I've been, you know, we've been interacting with some of our fans on there. Alan Meekin is down in Indonesia. Amazing guy doing conservation down there. He's been posting pictures of gibbons this week, you know, because we awesome. covered gibbons, orangutans. And then he had this huge corpse flower. That he posted. I could not believe it. I didn't think they were that big as tall no, as he was. I had no idea. Yeah. Oh, it was it was amazing. And then just another fan real quick in Australia. You know, we have a great listeners down there. And it's Pippa Disney Le- Leslie. And she was going back and forth with us talking about going to grad school. And she wants to study animal physiology behavior. 
So I told her your story, Angie. And I said, you know, follow Angie's footsteps. And I encouraged her to just do it. Just do it. So shout out to her down there in Australia. Awesome. Yes. I love being a zookeeper, but I realize physiology is where my heart and soul is at. Mm -hmm. And so my advice would be just go for it. And if you can, in the meantime, do a lot of traveling to awesome places so you can see the wild and wild spaces, why we still have them. And then makes you want to fight even harder each day to save them. Yeah. Yeah, So I just want to give her a shout out and encourage her. Yeah, do it. Just do it. Just do it. So jumping back into gold line tamarins, you know, these are monkeys. So last week we talked about an ape species, a lesser ape, the gibbons and Symangs. These, this is a monkey. They're part of the new world monkeys. And the new world monkeys are five families of primates found in Central and South America. And so I'm going to get into the, the history here in a second. But you're talking about what these things look like. Like they are just gorgeous. Gorgeous. Oh, they're, they're striking. I mean, that's why I got up every morning at 4.30 in the morning to drive to the zoo to get there at 5.30 to look at them in the daylight. Mm-hmm. They, I mean, gold line tamarins kind of says it all, but mm-hmm. they just have this bright reddish orange fur that's extra long around their face, mm-hmm. like the mane of a lion. Lion, and, yeah. And then they have this dark black, dark brown face that's hairless and, it, and their ears. So it really makes the mane stand out. I mean, it's just like the contrast for people that are into photography and things like that. It's mm-hmm. just, they're just mm-hmm. stunning, just stunning. And then the golden hair frames the rest of their body. I mean, they're pretty much all the same, all the same color. And it's just beautiful gold, orange, reddish brown coat. Just beautiful. Yeah. And of the, of the tamarins, they're the largest species. They stand about, their height is about 10 inches, just a little over 10 inches on average, uh, 26 centimeters. And then they weigh about 1.3 pounds or 620 grams. So not huge, but for the tamarins, they're, they're, they're kind of big. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. And they, like I had mentioned earlier, they're arboreal. So they live in dense forest up in the trees, maybe anywhere from 10 to 30 meters off the ground. They just stay in the closed canopy and move about the trees and rarely go to the ground, which is what Zoolana utilized to, to keep them on this free, this amazing free range exhibit. Right, right. And, you know, talking about where they live, we've said southeast uh, portion of Brazil on the Atlantic coast. So they're known in an area known as the Atlantic Forest there. Mm-hmm. But Again, they're down to like less than 2% of their native range is left. So, right. and there's, yeah, and they're in these 14 highly fragmented forests. Mm-hmm. So, the population is a little bit fragmented. And the, the total area mass that they have is about 60 square miles or 150 square kilometers, roughly. Right. That's their total habitat left for yes. them. Yes. And they're, and within that, they're basically, confined, for lack of better terms, into three different reserves or private mm-hmm. areas in this Atlantic uh, Atlantic Forest region. There's the Poca das Antas Biological Reserve, Fandiza Unana, and then another Fazinda Unial Biological Reserve, and then a private reintroduction program. So right, right, very, right. Very, very limited in, uh, in space. Right. And looking at those areas, so you said the Poca das Antas is kind of known as a swamp forest. So these have, you know, standing water, like you said, are pretty much around the trees uh, in that whole area. And then the other area that as high as they go is, is less than a thousand feet above sea level or 300 meters, these lowland forests. So they don't, they don't go up really high. You know, they're, they're kind of in these areas under a thousand feet. And these are the areas that obviously have been deforested or or removed uh, from there. And I did read in there too that the tamarins, you know, looking at their habitat, that they really prefer these old growth trees, mature trees with, you know, not only branching, but probably more forage material food for them. You know, they they don't like new growth forests, you know, younger trees that, that doesn't support them as well. Right. So- yeah, when we're talking about clearing habitat and trying to rehabilitate habitat. You have to think from the animal's perspective. Yeah, we what's can their think, natural oh, history. Mm-hmm. Right, we're going to go in and rehabilitate this land. Well, 
how many decades is that going to take until the animals can fully utilize it to their benefit, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So it, it's when you start thinking about all of the stuff and all of the pressures these animals are under, it's such a complex, uh, it's just, it's, it's, I know sometimes it gets disheartening, but we, we can't overcome these problems. And we are with this story. We are overcoming it, but we are going to get to the hopeful part. Don't you worry. Yes. <laughs> I'm just saying when I really thought about this and, you know, you you go through the thought process of, okay, we clear out these forests and we graze cattle on it and then we move on and then, you know, they say, oh, the forest can come back. You know, that's what some people in their defense of what they do, their practices, oh, it comes back anyways. Well, sure, the trees might come back and some plants might come back, might, maybe. But what about all the animals that used to live there? You just destroyed their home. And they don't have a home to go to. It's going to take decades for that area to rehabilitate to be a viable biome. So, very complex. It's it's. Uh, I know it can get frustrating. Well, Chris, you bring up some really really good points uh, because of the fact that the golden line tamarind has been reintroduced to certain areas due to habitat loss and these reintroduction mm-hmm. programs, which we'll talk about here in a second. The researchers are noticing that there is effects on their behavior, effects on juvenile behavior. There's increase Mm -hmm. in inbreeding uh, because of these pocketed, fragmented populations. And so it's not going to be the same, as as you mentioned. And there's scientific data that's coming up to pretty much support that and say, like, yeah, their behavior is changing. They're Mm -hmm. They aren't, you know, they're not learning to forage as much as they normally would. Uh, and just, yeah. So it's, it's, you got, like you said, you have to think the whole big picture. No, you're right. And, and it's, it leads us into why I care about this species. And one of the things when you were talking about that, I was reading was talking about the importance of seed dispersal and how tamarinds, one of the things scientists know is when they do eat these fruits and seeds and things, they carry them in their guts for, for quite a while. So they can range a wide, you know, go on a wide range and, and disperse these seeds, which encourages mm-hmm. new growth. So when I go back to my last point, you know, say you come in and clear part of the forest and move on and the forest starts to regenerate, but you don't have these animals in there dispersing seeds, doing what they normally do. And then you have all these mutualistic relationships being disrupted. So, you know, the one good thing I did read that they said in the reintroduction, you were talking about change in behavior is on the edges of where like tamarins really like to be. They are seeing some regrowth on the edges of the forest where they have been cleared. And so these tamarins are there dispersing these seeds. So some of that is coming back, but again, it's going to take a long time. It takes a long, long time. And, Mm -hmm. and I was reading that there was up to 96 plant species, the golden lion tamarins, just golden lion tamarins. We haven't even mm-hmm. started talking about all the other tamarins, mm-hmm. but just gold lion tamarins, 96 species of plant that they've been shown in Atlantic forest that they've been shown to have mutualistic interaction with, which means mm-hmm. they help germinate these plant seeds in various locations. And because gold lion tamarins have been monitored for so long due to their population crash back in the 70s, Researchers have really observed this in real time when the golden lion tamarins are not in a forest that they should be in, plant species decline. And then when they're reintroduced due to several successful breeding programs, the plant species go up. So it's, it's, it's not a joke. It's, it really is this very important a mutualistic relationship and interaction. And, and of course we're more animal experts and animal lovers, but Mm. the more you and I do this podcast, the more Mm. and more, I I just wish I would have paid better attention to my plant biology class. So (laughs) that's another advice I have for young budding conservationists. The ecosystem, it's very complex and so many interactions and you can't just rule, you can't not think about plants and you can't not think about water and you can't not think about the climate and you can't not think about pollution, right? It's yeah. Uh, yeah. If you love these furry, scaly, feathery critters, you got to think about the whole big picture. So Yeah. I mean, but- even, you know, and I would say even, you know, microorganisms, 
you know, the insects, which we, we don't really touch upon. Yes. Yeah. But even, know. you See, know, I microbes. Even, yeah. I didn't even think it. There, I didn't, I didn't even mention those. I mean, Thank you. That's why we're good podcast yeah. partners. I left <laughs> no, them but out. I mean the whole, like, the largest the whole class thing. of animals. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, but I'm just saying the whole thing together, mm-hmm. and you can't just go kill it all off in a major, massive area and just expect it to rebound like that. It, right. it, 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 it will take decades and decades to rehabilitate a lot of these areas. I think. Right. I don't. You know, it's just we're talking about the biome, but what else does gold line tamarins kind of teach us? Oh, Chris, gold lion tamarins are like the ambassador, the exemplary story of how zoos stepped in and literally saved this gorgeous golden monkey. In the early 1970s, there were fewer than about 200 gold lion tamarins in the wild. Okay, Back in the day, back in the 70s, before I was mm-hmm. even born. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And you too. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, it was last century. I don't even. <laughs> That's right. Doesn't count. <laughs> so zoos and conservation groups stepped in on an international scale to help save the gold lion tamarin. And by 1984, the National Zoo, Smithsonian's National Zoo in DC, and World Wildlife Fund had spearheaded some of these captive breeding programs through through several zoos worldwide. And they started a reintroduction program. And basically by 1996, the gold lion tamarin had gone from critically endangered to endangered due to these successful reintroduction programs from captive reared gold lion tamarins. And now, Chris, it's estimated that there's up to 3,200 individuals in the wild and close Mm -hmm. to 500 individuals in 150 zoos. So it's just one of these conservation stories that goes to show that when agencies and zoological parks work together on saving a species and there's mm-hmm. enough money and time and energy and care because because they're just such a beautiful and charismatic and important, ecologically important species, mm-hmm. that it can be done. And it has been done. Mm-hmm. And the, the IUCN in 2008 – Estimated there's only a thousand mature individuals, so that doesn't count all the juveniles. Mm. But they're also raising a red flag because of this extreme habitat fragmentation that you mentioned earlier. And Mm. of course, habitat destruction due to agricultural and urbanization and things like that. Mm. And so their population is estimated to be stable, which is incredible after Mm -hmm. almost being wiped out 40 years ago or, or more. But they're not out of the woods, pardon the pun, yet, because mm-hmm. as you mentioned, there's a lot of a lot of stuff going on and a different administration yeah. now than there used to be. Uh, the fires we don't think are really in that area, so that's not necessarily a concern at this point. And and the gold line tamarins that are in these reserves, of course, are monitored by researchers and and the country really believes in protecting gold line tamarins. And I know it is a top issue. There are flagship species for that region and things like that and all, and all the cross institutional and international experts and conservationists and zoological experts that have you know put their time sweat blood tears into saving these guys and and it for the most part has worked but mm-hmm. we can't get we can't get sloppy now right we can't get lazy no now. no no no, and it just it, it just underlines again what we've been saying. I mean, just add that one to the list. You know, Przewalski horse, black-footed ferret, California condor. The oryx. We got to do the oryx soon. I'm super excited about that. The too. oryx. I mean, there's a ton of species that zoos, accredited institutions around the world have come together to save, and they and they're still fighting. I mean, they're still fighting. We have many, many, many more stories to tell. Yeah. Well, and that's of, the other thing too. Success. I always think yeah. zoos. Well, that's the other story too, Chris, to tell is I. I think zoos don't always get enough credit for some of these awesome reintroduction programs that they do. So they can learn yeah. a lot about the li- the animals while they're living under human care. And then mm-hmm. if, and then the stars align, so they do have habitat and they have protection by the government, mm-hmm. everything's a go, then certain species can be reinduced super successfully as with the golden yeah. lion tamarind. Yeah. 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 It's another great one. It's another great one. And one that, you know, we, we need to, to add that to our list of animals that, that we have saved from the brink of extinction. 
Now, just run it into where tamarins fit in. You know, where what is a tamarin per se in the primate land that, that we talked about? So last week we talked about gibbons. They're a lesser ape. You know, the apes with us and, and orangutans and gorillas and bonobos and, and chimpanzees. I think that's all of them. Um, you know, now you have tamarins. We also have lemurs, which we haven't covered yet, which is coming soon. And, you know, they fit in all the other primates or monkeys. Now, tamarins are the smallest primates in the world. That That is one thing we know about them, where they fit in. Now, tamarins and they're specifically... Cute. They are cute. Uh, they are. Ah, uh, <laughs> yeah. there are a lot of cute ones. <laughs> yeah, they're like little people. They're little tiny There's people. There's the one with a mustache. I forget. What is that? The uh, emperor. Yeah, the emperor. The yeah. emperor. Yeah, the emperor tamarin. Literally yeah, a he's awesome. little white mustache on black yeah. fur. It's incredible. <laughs> So they're they're all part of the family Calatricidae, and that basically I think means Calatricidae. I, th- I think Calatricidae workshops, okay. but I could be wrong. I've been wrong like once or twice okay. before. No, 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 never. Uh, Calatricidae. <laughs> what does it mean? What does it mean? Isn't that is that Spanish? Kind of Spanish? I don't know. Uh, uh, you, you speak Spanish. I do, and for the most part, I mean it's not pretty, uh, yeah, yeah. but. Yeah, well, basically just means it's a family of New World monkeys. I don't know necessarily yeah. what it means. Beautiful hair is what I saw. Oh. Beautiful hair. Yeah, then that's I don't not, know. Maybe I that's not Spanish. I don't, I don't know if it's Spanish. Spanish. It's Latin. <laughs> it's, uh, it might be Latin. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Anyways, I mean, this is a family from... One of my Calatricka Day expert friends to, uh, yeah, yeah, to there you tag go. us and tell us what's Chime up. In. Okay, okay. Well, this family is the part of the New World monkeys of tamarins. Lion tamarins, which we're covering right now, and marmosets. So there's about 60 of them, and then half of those are tamarins, and then we're going to get to the four specific lion tamarins. Now, this is what I thought was was really curious about this, and, and kind of going down this rabbit hole a little bit, was the smallest primate in the world. And so they had some interesting scientific debate thinking this might have been just an ancient lineage of primate, and that's why they were so small. Okay. Okay. Not as advanced as other primates. Again, kind of like lemurs. You know, lemurs are, are their own thing out there. Oh, they but are. But they don't they think ever. that's. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> lemurs. They're so goofy. But DNA analysis, and now that we have genetics, is starting to prove that's not true. That they think this is actually a dwarf species of primate. Now, we go back a few pods ago. Okay, mm-hmm. so we talked about Komodo dragons, largest lizard in the world. We thought that was gigantism, but that we proved, or we proved, we we talked about how that wasn't true, that they were actually dwarfs right. mm-hmm. of an ancient, a more ancient species that lived in Australia. And so they're actually smaller. I know, I know, <laughs> everything in Australia. So... Then they, they, you get in this debate, well, how can you... So that's the whole theory of dwarfism that we talked about on islands where there's limited resources, small land, so animals evolve to be smaller, not eat as much, you know, and those are the ones that survive when the bigger but ones really like me sense. would die off. Amazon is vast, and why would they evolve to be smaller? Exactly. So then they're like, okay, how the heck can you have dwarfism on mainland? Well, way back when... In South America, it was actually like a bunch of little islands because of so much moisture and water. So there was actually a bunch of little islands in the Amazon. Okay. So back then. It was like a swamp or a bog or something? Yeah. A a bog, that's more north, so a swamp. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, but like, you know, know, it's the largest river in the world. and, And now back then when the ice caps were lower and you had higher sea rise, things like that, so they actually evolved on these little islands in South America to be smaller. So that was kind of cool. It was that really is. cool stuff. See, really cool stuff. Learning yeah. every week in this podcast. I love it. <laughs> now, if we go looking at gold line tamarind specifically, they're part of the Leonopithecus. Thecus. Did I get that right? Leontopithecus genus. I, like I trust you. And yeah, okay, Leontopithecus rosalia is the golden lion tamarind. Mm -hmm. Now within the lion tamarind four species, that's one. Mm -hmm. Then you have the golden headed lion tamarind. Yes, that that is always confusing. 
Their names mm-hmm. are so close. Mm-hmm. But the gold mm-hmm. Mayan tamarind is all golden, except for, of course, their uh, their black face. Face. Where yeah. the golden headed lion tavern follows suit. It has the golden lion mm-hmm. head, the gold, beautiful right. color, the long, silky mane, if you will. But then the mm-hmm. rest of their body mm-hmm. is blackish brown dark brown brown yeah. yeah dark dark yeah 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 good good and then you have the black lion tamarind and then the super guy lion tamarind so those are the four in the lion tamarind uh species or genus genus all separate species mm-hmm now, just quickly on evolution we've done primates uh, a lot but again I thought this was pretty cool it is about 40 million years ago is when a simian or a primate migrated to South America from Africa. On a raft. Africa. I yes, know. I know. It's Isn't nuts. that crazy? It's nuts. So, uh, yeah. Like so just it's one kind of the, or like a couple of them? I, I, I need to know how this all went down. Reading what scientists think what happened was they pretty much are sure they did not come through North America. We have no fossil record whatsoever from North America. Okay. So they thought they had really two ways of getting here, over the Pacific or over the Atlantic. Well, Pacific is huge, right? Mm -hmm. And what they think is in the Atlantic Ridge and these mountains that there was probably little refuges, a refuge Mm -hmm. that they could land on and they made a live there for a while and then they got on another raft of vegetation and floated for a while to the next one and they just kind of hopped their way over into South America. And then they land in like the mother of all amazing places, right? Oh my god! I know, I know, I know. That's just so now, incredible. Now, tamarins, yeah, if you look at the primate family, I mean, they're not too far from us. You know, you're, you're still talking millions and millions, you know, tens of millions of years. But really the, the most distant looking at this family tree, which again, we're going to have to come to at some point, is the lemurs, the lorises. Uh, they're they're kind of out there in the primate family, but the tamarins are right there with the New World monkeys, mm-hmm. which then you know you go up to the apes and baboons and stuff. So not too far from us. Now, I have talked about the largest primate was that super orangutan over in Asia. Mm-hmm. So I thought, well, how about the smallest primate today? Aww. You might know this one. You might know this one. Is it a dwarf marmoset? Pygmy, close. Pygmy. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. There you go. Good. I knew you'd know it. Uh, ding, ding, ding. I got to Google a picture of it really quick, though, because I just... Yeah. I just oh, it's so cute. It's cute. Let's see. Yes. So these things are native to South America and the Amazon River. So these ones are, are battling the fires right now. They are about six inches in length, and they weigh three and a half grams or 100 ounces. <laughs> so they're tiny. They're tiny, tiny little pygmy marmosets. Oh, there they are. Oh, mm-hmm. they're so cute. I know, I know, I know. They're really cute. They're really cute. Don't Google if you're driving, everyone, but if you're not, check them out. Yeah, no. <laughs> oh, my goodness. They look like they can fit on somebody's finger. Yeah. Is that even a real picture, or is that just like a... Uh, six inches, yeah. I mean, palm your hand, you know? So they're not they're not too big. Now, the average lifespan of a golden lion tamarind is about 14 years under human care, I, I saw somewhere on another another site that they thought 20, but 14 is about mm-hmm. average. And in the wild, about eight years in the wild. Yeah, tough. well, and even so with that toughness and something we need to think about, too, when we're talking about trying to grow populations, uh, is that 50% of the juveniles die within the first year. 50%. Yeah, it's tough. Out of it's two. tough out there. So it's tough to be to yeah, get to that mature adulthood. And yeah, so... It's they're not going to recover as fast as other species, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, an interesting fact of physiology on tamarins. Okay, they're a primate. Now, most primates have nails, like just like us, right on our fingers. We have fingers. Yeah, fingernails, toenails. Mm-hmm. That's what most primates have. But tamarins have claws, mm-hmm. which. That, I think that's where they used to think they were an ancient lineage, just looking at physiology, oh, okay. because most primates don't have claws, but these do, and they think it's just an evolutionary reversal because they they're need this. They're claw like nails, though. They're not. I don't think they're retractable. No, right? no, no, no. They're just but, claw like nails, but yeah. definitely different than old world primates, or definitely your apes. 
Right, right. And the claw-like nails are called tegulae, where the flat nails are called ungulae. So that's us. We're ungulae. And this this is really important for them to evolve. You know that way. Is they that can, why I love ungulates? Because I probably. have ungulates. Yeah, yeah ungulates on your <laughs> ungu- ungulates. I just figured it all out. It all makes sense now. <laughs> so, but a lot. I mean, it makes sense. So it allows them to climb these trees, hang. You know, walking, leaping, things like that. Um, because one of the things that's interesting is they don't have prehensile tails, where a lot of New World monkeys do. Right, right. Yeah. Yes, it is not prehensile. It's not used to swing to branches or anything Mm-mm. like that. Mm-mm. But these, Mm-mm. but these slender fingers and these uh, claw-like nails are really important for their nutrition. Hmm. 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 They right. basically have this technique called micro manipulation, where they can grab insects with these, their their fingers and, to, and put them in the crevices of tree barks and pull things out. When they're, right. You know and. Yeah, nice it helps, grub. Like a, yeah, it helps them get snare fruit and birds and insects and mm-hmm. all sorts of yummy things. Yeah, yeah. Like so, talking about what they eat, they're omnivores. Uh, they may eat some lizards sometimes, or small invertebrates. You know, some who knows yeah. grasshoppers, things like that. Any any mm-hmm. anything smaller than them, the chances are they will eat them. You know, like you said, they're they're really dexterous with those hands a little bit, and. Just amazing creatures. I, I know one of the things I was reading about behavior, you know, leading you into behavior is, you know, kind of like I was thinking, it made me think of the meerkats. And I know that's just a Patreon only episode, amazing animals to cover, but talking about sharing food with the family, right? Mm-hmm. So tamarins in their family groups will share food. So like juveniles will play with the parents and steal their food and run away like, ha ha ha. And the parents are like, it's okay. Eat, you know, eat. Mm-hmm. So a lot of caretaking, a lot of love, but I, I, I imagine, you know, you have a lot of experience studying their behavior. So this is probably going to be fascinating to hear about. Oh yeah. Chris, they were so fun to watch. Even if I was tired from going to the club the night before, <laughs> or whatever it was. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but Atlanta had some really fun, fun music venues. So that's, <laughs> that was back in the day. I'm sure they it's still a city. Uh, it's a good city. It's a good city. Yeah, it's a fun, fun city. And they're really interactive during the day. And as I mentioned earlier, at the zoo, they were nest boxes. And then they emerge at the crack of dawn and come out and eat and forage for most of the day and interact with their family and play around and just, just have a good old time. But in the wild, they're going to build their, build their sleeping dens or sleeping nests uh, in different places each night, like either in the hollow of a tree or tucked into some branches in the corner. And researchers think that they switch nest sites each day to help to help reduce predation, uh, the chance of a predator smelling where they live and knowing where their family is. And to get around, they have what's called a, a, a quad gate, meaning they can use all fours to get around and go from branch to branch and leap up. And like Chris said, they're good climbers. Uh, and they basically can walk, run, s- spring, and leap between the vines and the branches. Just very, very agile. And they're just so fun to watch. And like I said, they can be very busy when they are active during mm-hmm. the day. But they're a social species, very, very social. Uh, in the wild, they're found in groups of two to eight and usually made of family members. So they're, they love their families. They hang out together. And in the family, it's going to usually be made of a breeding pair, a male and female. They're typically monogamous. Uh, there's, there's some inferences where that may not happen. Uh, but in general, they're going to s- stick as the same breeding pair. And there are reports sometimes of some extended families uh, being blended, if you will. But in general, it'll be the breeding pair and their juvenile offspring and then maybe some young offspring. And then the kids eventually will get pushed out of the group when they're like four or five and to go make their own families. And just like other primates, they spend a lot of time mutually grooming each other. Mm -hmm. And typically in gold lion tamarins, the male is going to groom the female. And they spend a lot of time just grooming and huddling together. So it's really cute and interactive. And then those juveniles, those little buggers are just going to come play and pester mom and dad or sister, Mm -hmm. brother, uh, and run around and wrestle and just make noises and fake get mad at each other. And then 
makeup and just, you know, just do all sorts of just busy where there were some times when I'd be taking behavior data where to the point where sometimes Chris, when I was taking the behavioral data, I was, I'm like missing half of the stuff they're doing. The fun stuff. Yeah. <laughs> the, the fun stuff. stuff. Cause yeah. Yeah. Cause it was just like so busy. And I would, I would go back to my researcher that I was working for and be like, Molly, I'm sorry, but you know, from whatever, 7 a.m. to 7, 10, they were just whipping around the exhibit. And I pretty much just had to put locomotion for the whole time because I could, I know they were playing and doing other things, but, but she mm-hmm. understood it. You know, free help is you, you get what you can get. <laughs> <laughs> right, 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 right. So, but no, but it, they're a lot, they're a lot of, a lot of fun, a lot of fun to watch and a lot of play, which of course in a primate species or in species in general, the play behavior is very, very important. It teaches them all about social interactions and learning to read body language and potentially how to ward off predators, right? If they are attacked mm-hmm, by something. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So it's, it, it is really key and an important part of their family group and how they relate to each other and and how they interact with one another so you were talking about predators i I think some of the things that that can eat them birds of prey you know we we talk about that some snakes and then maybe some wild cats down there so i was just starting to think like you know alarm calls or something because i don't remember tamarins being all that vocal you know how loud they were well you probably just didn't catch them at the right time Mm -hmm. Uh, and i don't i don't i don't have the data in front of me about how frequently they vocalize right Mm -hmm. like i feel like gibbons yeah, uh, they that's not, you know, gibbons are like world. one of the most vocal groups as far as percent of time mm-hmm. per day. Maybe it's just when they're under human care. I don't know. Mm-hmm. But gold line tamarins are very vocal. In fact, they have up to 17 different specific calls that mm-hmm. can be anything from alarms to defense uh, to foraging behavior to juveniles to talking to their parents, being like, hey, can I mm-hmm, please mm-hmm. have a piece of that fruit? And all the different sounds that they can make include a trilling sound for solo activity. Uh, they can do a clucking when they're foraging, whining, of course, that one I'm very familiar with. You just saw my voice. <laughs> yes. I'm sure you're going to edit it out of the podcast. Yeah. My voice get up and mommy, mommy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. And uh, so, yeah, so there's going to be some whimes and peeps. Uh, my Boys definitely do that. Bless their hearts. Mm-hmm. And along with other sounds such as rasp or screeches, mm-hmm. which those are fun when they're like joyful screeches of delight when they're playing with their with their siblings. And they definitely have different vocalizations depending on, like you said, if it's a predator encounter or is it with a sibling or is it with a mom or are they foraging? Are they mutual grooming? So the type of vocalization they're giving out should be somewhat indicative of what what they're doing and what they're interacting with. And Chris, although vocalization is a one of their primary ways to communicate with one another, it's also important to note that they do some scent marking as a way to communicate with each other. And they also, of course, being a very animated and intelligent species, a social species, they, of course, just like me and you, use a lot of body language and facial expressions to communicate to one another what's happening. So, and for instance, Chris, one of my, one of my favorites ones, cause it is, even though it's tough, it's kind of cute. It's one of their aggressive behaviors where they'll open their mouth and arch their back and just stare. <laughs> <laughs> and looking like a tough guy or a tough girl. I know, I know. A little but they're so yeah. cute. It's like, oh my gosh. But it, but but it, but it works. I mean, they they communicate that with each other effective, mm-hmm. and usually the one knows to back mm-hmm. down and things like that. When you when just like my boys, when they see when they, I usually don't do the open mouth. I just do the stare. Just that. Yeah, stare. yeah, yeah, they yeah, know, yeah. The mom yeah, stare. The yeah. Quiet stare yeah. is often more alarming than yeah vocalizing using my mom vocalizations. So. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. golden lion tamarins aren't too far from us when it comes to that. That's for sure. That's hilarious. I mean, I you know being up close with the tamarins too over the years and and seeing them, you know, I can just imagine that little threat display. Now, one thing I read that was that was curious, you know, leading into reproduction, twins are common, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Which is important yeah. because. One out of two doesn't make it to be a year old. So I know maybe that's I their know, evolutionary strategy. Uh, who knows? Mm-hmm. But yes, Chris, twins are really common. 
and the gestation length is going to be about four months or so. And just to back up a little bit is that there's usually the one breeding pair per group, the mom and the dad, and they're going to breed on average twice a year, uh, depending on how the rainy season is and how the vegetation growth is. And their mating season is going to shift a little bit depending on how the rains and how the rainy season is going. Anywhere from late March to mid-June is when they'll breed, uh, with births peaking around September to February when, of course, it's raining. And Chris, since they're a bonded pair and often monogamous, they already spend a lot of time mutually grooming and cuddling. I was interested to see if there was any other courtship behaviors during this peak breeding time. And there are reports that, of course, a male will start to groom more often and do a little more sniffing. But he also does this tongue flicking to entice the female. (laughs) See how that works. (laughs) So I just try to put myself in little miss tamarind shoes <laughs> and i'm all about the grooming <laughs> sniffing man, whatever, that, whatever. Uh, that could go either yeah, way for yeah. me but the tongue flicking <laughs> i just don't see it i just i gotta write this book oh mating strategies oh my goodness oh i know i keep i keep telling john i'm like you've got to at the zoo you've got to do a valentine's day uh, special event right. and and we'll do courtship behaviors and we can like either act them out and they can guess which ones are which. I mean, not act all no, of them. No, 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 no. The, you know, the, the, the PG, yeah, G, PG. Mm, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Like, I mean, think about some of them. I, we need to do another bird. Mm-hmm. Some of these bird displays are just incredible. Mm-hmm. And and who knew? I didn't know this. I didn't yeah. see this when I studied them yeah. in, uh, in Atlanta. But male golden line tamarins are tongue flickers to attract their female. And <laughs> That's it works. awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> and when it works, like I said, there'll be some twins that come out four months later, uh, hopefully healthy. Mm-hmm. And Chris, you're going to love this. You're definitely one of the dad of the years that I know. Yeah. And you're a lot like a golden lion tamarind. Oh, okay. So we got one. We got another one. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yes, definitely not a deadbeat bad yes. dad. Because of their strong family bond, they have what is considered a cooperative child rearing strategy. So both adults help raise the offspring. However, in gold mine tamarins, the males do a big brunt of the work. In fact, the majority of it. Mm-hmm. They'll often carry their youngs on their backs in between feedings. And spend a lot of time with them, playing with them, grooming them. So the mother, of course, is involved too. Very, you know, it's very important in the primate society. But yeah, the dad does a lot. Mm-hmm. He's a very, very good golden lion tamarind daddy. Just like good, him. good. I love and it. I guess yeah. I guess like lions too, right? So the kind of their name. Works yeah, for that yeah. They're good dads. They're good dads. Pretty good dads. Yeah, yeah. And then the offspring, they're going to mature about mm, 18 months for females, 24 months for males. But once again, they're probably not going to start breeding till, especially if they're male, four and older, mm. uh, till they go, you know, start their own families, if you will. And, and often the juveniles, they, even though they might even be sexually mature, they'll stay with their family groups for a while, right. up to three, four years or so is not uncommon. Well, it's, you know, and we, they only live to be eight in the wild, I mean, that's not very long to, to, you know, spread your genetics. But like you said, they having twins and breeding twice a year, that may help their numbers kind of climb up like we're seeing, like we're seeing, right? Sure. Yeah. yeah there's a lot. I mean, there's a lot of hope and there's a lot of attention spent on mm-hmm. these guys. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of people fighting for them. There's, I mean, zoos worldwide. Mm-hmm. And I mean, check out your local credit zoo. You'll probably see them there, the yeah. National Zoo, yeah, yeah, Zoo Atlanta, right, right, or in general, most accredited zoos house at least some type of tamarind. So if you're at a local zoo that has a tamarind, take a picture and tell us what it is. Put it put it on our Facebook page. Yeah, always yeah, loving to learn to see what 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 else is out there as well. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And you know, we've, we've talked about the conservation story, and it is a su- successful story. Their numbers are increasing. They were downlisted from critically endangered to endangered, which is good. That's a good direction to be going into. But again, you know, they they are suffering some habitat destruction, stuff like that. Before we jump into organizations, Angie, I'm going to 
I don't know, pick a fight, I guess. I don't know. A lot of our friends that I used to, that I worked with, and they're still my friends. They, they might not like me saying this. Bottom line, around the world, we have to reduce beef consumption. We just have to, Angie. I, I, it's not just the United States. I mean, a few weeks ago, we talked about wolves and, and cattle ranching and wolves being killed uh, because of, of attacks on cattle. It, it's we've got to look at other sources of, of protein. Now, if you're not a vegetarian or a vegan, I get it. I get it. You know, we're omnivores. You know, you eat animal protein. I just, I would suggest for now, look at other sources of animal protein. Now that carries with it other problems. Like I eat a lot of fish now, you know, and we're overfishing the oceans or, you know, some other problems with animal protein. But Looking at well, this, well, and then there's tofu, yeah. but they're tearing down forests for soy. To make soy. So it's it's uh, it's, it, uh, it's tough. But I think right now, today, if you want to make a difference, is my challenge to the listeners and to me myself is to cut my beef in consumption in half. Just cut it in half. You know, we have meatless. So what does that look like for you? Do you think for you does that beef? Once a week is that beef? Yeah, probably. Monthly? Is yeah, that beef? once a week now. I think once a week. Okay. You know, I'm I'm awesome. You know, I'm eating some more lamb and fish and stuff like that. But mm-hmm. you know, it's mm-hmm. it's I try to go meatless meals to, you know, get yeah meatless Mondays. Yeah, get my protein from other sources. I just I remember when Jane Goodall a few years ago when we heard her speak at at UF there in Florida, and she was talking about in Africa a major problem of habitat destruction was now clearing forests for cattle. She even said it, Mm -hmm. you know, and it it, it was an issue in my issues class that I taught back there in the day that sustainable ag and we, and right now what they're doing in Brazil is not sustainable or in South America, the cattle that are being raised there is not sustainable, you know, and that is where big ag has to go. And I know they're, they're paying some lip service to it and they are making some changes, but until, we scream with one voice, you know, they're going to keep doing what they're doing down there. Now, a lot of this beef that's being produced in South America isn't coming here to the United States. I mean, it's going to Asia and uh, the Middle East is another place with big markets. So demand is going up in those areas of the world. That is where too, I think we need to cut down on, on beef consumption and look at other sources of protein because it's it's horrific. It's th- these fires in the Amazon. It's horrific. It's horrific. And oh yeah, it's it's scary. Yeah. And it's but yes, people can change habits. Uh, mm-hmm. I've been introducing tofu crumbles for taco mm-hmm. nights, and at first my family was a little skeptical, <laughs> if you will. Yeah. And I they've kind of come along and right. been like, hey, this is this is this is good mm-hmm. and this is why we're doing this and having conversations about it. And we are not a meat free family, uh, but I do try to reduce our beef consumption. Mm-hmm. I try to do bi monthly. Yeah. It's not always possible. Mm-hmm. Uh because once a week is super easy for us. Like that goal easy, yeah. We knock that out of the yeah. park. That's cause beef's kind of expensive. Yeah. And so okay, yeah, no problem. But now I want to, okay, let's really try to maybe only twice a month mm-hmm. and things like that. Mm-hmm. And buy locally. I'm lucky here that uh, we have uh, facilities at our university that can provide a local beef and things like that or farmer's markets. But still, it's just, just having that in the back of your brain to just try something, try mm-hmm. a little something new. Uh, and this day and age too, at least here in, in North America, uh, some of the plant proteins have really upped their and yeah, up their yeah, game. Yeah. And the one thing I really am dying to try is the Impossible Burger. It's good. I've had it. Is, it's good. Have, have it's good. It? It's good. Yeah, okay. it's good. It's really good. It's really good. It's supposed to be very, very good. I'm not a huge burger person to begin no, with. But, I, I love like a good black yeah, bean burger. Yeah. But, you know, for people that are, it, it could be a great option. And I know there's like a fast, fa- fast food chain here in the, in the U.S. that's going to start making it selling yeah, as well. Yeah. So, you know, vote, vote with your dollar and, yeah. and they're starting, people are starting to listen and it's, it's, you know, we can make a difference. One person can make a difference. We are making. Yeah. A and I don't, it's hard because I don't, you know, that's why I'm kind of keeping some of the same themes and I brought this up before, but you know, it seems like if I was a listener, I'm sitting there like, well, they, Chris and Angie said, don't 
do this palm oil and don't do this wood and don't do this beef. Oh, it's impossible. I know. To, yeah. It, it, no, it's, it's just one, try one little thing. Yeah. Right there. Yeah. You can't do it all. And we get that. But I think everybody listening, if you could cut your beef consumption in half and we spread that message that these beef producers will, will take notice. And it's really to, to help uh, right now to help the Amazon, you know, Hey, I'm not going to eat beef until you get along with wolves. You find a way to get along with wolves. You don't call for the <laughs> the hunting and killing of wolves, which we yeah. know the beef council here in the United States has said they support, which is horrible. And then also down in, in Amazon, Hey, you guys need to stop clearing the Amazon rainforest to make pastures or to grow cattle feed. You know, I'm sorry. It, it's, we've got to, to, to take a stand and and now is the time not not in 10 years right not in 10 years it'll be too late well we have to think about efficient things to feed lots of people and efficient ways to use land because mm-hmm. there's just more people and more people more people more people right. but also the animals like mm-hmm. to help them right. that's that's just as important they've been here longer than right. us all right so who's who's out there fighting for them then in that spirit awesome well First and foremost, to talk about the Amazon, the crisis in the Amazon, I just want to give our listeners a link to Earth Alliance. So this is an environmental group co-funded by my buddy. He's not really my buddy, <laughs> but Leonardo DiCaprio. I want he's he's my wannabe buddy. Yes, to be yes, buddy. yes. Uh, or how about a wannabe in an interview, something like that. Uh, but anyways, he's amazing. He's awesome. He's donated like five million dollars. Uh, kind of put together this Earth Alliance group and donated like $5 million. And then the other really cool thing about Earth Alliance, which is why I know they're amazing. And if you are able to donate money, it's going directly to the people that have the resources to help this crisis in the Amazon. Because the Earth Alliance GoFundMe initiative is hosted by our buddies, Dr. Robin Moore and Mm -hmm. Dr. Barney Long at Global Wildlife Conservation, a Mm -hmm. big, big group that we've highlighted in the past. Love them, love them. them. They're amazing. So they paired up, paired up with my buddy Leo. Maybe I should see if Dr. Barney Long can hook a girl. Yeah, there you Uh, go, there you go, there you go. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, um, But yeah, and actually, I want to get Dr. Robin Moore back too. um, So they're just, they're just so fun Mm -hmm. to talk to. And uh, but yeah, so they, a hundred percent of the donations go directly to protecting the Amazon. And they're distributed to the indigenous communities and other local partners to combat the fires, protect the lands, uh, and provide relief to the communities that are impacted. And so, yeah, I mean, they're helping put these fires out. So check out their website. There's a ton of information about the Amazon and what's happening and what it means for the planet uh, at at www.ealliance, that's E-A-L-L-I-A-N-C-E dot org slash Amazon fund. And we'll put it on our show notes as well. Or I'm sure if you follow Leonardo DiCaprio or Global Wildlife Conservation, uh, you can find links on their website as well. So a big shout out for awesome people doing awesome things to try to protect the Amazon Earth Alliance. Their uh, their funds are 100% is going to protect the Amazon, which is key because yep. most organizations, unfortunately, aren't able to give 100% Mm-mm. because they have to pay their electricity bills right, right. and their staff and things like that. And so uh, when you have a big dog like Leonardo DiCaprio – Help him. The yeah, yeah. He, he can he can move the earth. Yes, so, yes, yes. Yeah. And then also keep in mind too, if you can't donate money, because not a lot of people can. As Chris mentioned, you can skip the beef. You can go carbon free, so you can walk mm-hmm. or take your bike or take a train that's already running, and or you can take a sailboat like that young lady Greta. Mm-hmm. That, came to North America via a carbon free sailboat. Mm-hmm. So there's lots of different things that you could do if you obviously don't have any money as well. And just stay informed and tell maybe tell your rich aunt about it, right? Somebody yeah, I know, or I know. something uh, that does have money. And then from a more local perspective, focusing just on golden lion tamarins, I want to highlight Save the Golden Lion Tamarin. They can be found on Facebook or at www.savethelyontamarin.org. And the Save the Golden Lion Tamarin organization, their mission is to raise funds to support and promote the efforts of the Golden Lion Tamarin Association, which is in Brazil. And what that does is it protects their natural habitat. 
in the Atlantic coastal forests of the Rio de Janeiro state of Brazil. And what Save the Golden Lion Tamarin does to help the Golden Lion Tamarin is they support Brazilian partners that help lead international efforts to stop the extinction crisis from happening. So they fill suitable forest that is left with gold lion tamarins. They plant forest corridors that connect these fragmented areas that Chris talked about, the fragmented forest. So helping populations interact with each other to reduce genetic inbreeding. And this one's huge, Chris. They also engage local people in actions to help restore the gold lion tamarins back to the people. So they get that whole interaction, that dynamic of getting the local people on board, understand that the golden lion tamarind is an ambassador am- animal for that region. It's only found there. Right. Nowhere else in the world mm-hmm. ever. This is where it needs to live. Mm-hmm. And this is where it's evolved to live. And then, of course, for the lion tamarinds that are inhabiting that area, they have protection for them and monitor the existing populations. So their website's really fascinating. And you can... um And you should definitely check it out, like them on Facebook. And they're a group just focusing all their energy and attention on saving the gold lion tamarins. Yeah. Like a lot of zoos, you know, there's tons of zoos in North America too, as well. And worldwide for that matter, that participate in the species survival program for the gold lion tamarin. And so you can also support golden lion tamarins by visiting your local accredited zoo Mm -hmm. and supporting them by buying popcorn or whatever. It is right, right, right. No, it's or a little, uh, or, or, or a little golden lion stuffy. Oh, man. oh, I know, so I know, cute. I know. It's so cute. They are so cute. Well, you know, this was this was a good one. It's one Angie's been wanting to do for a while. We just asked, you know, to help support us. Send this podcast to a friend. You know, share it. The more we grow our audience, the more we're spreading this conservation message. And we just love you. Yeah, you can have like fun with it on social mm-hmm. media. Like, show a picture of a golden lion tamarind. And then show a picture of an emperor tamarin mm-hmm. and have people pull which one they think is cuter. Yeah. It's to be, it's to be a really interesting pull, right? I mean, it depends <laughs> on do you like the gold line mane or do yeah. you like a mustache? mustache. I mean, they're yeah. both so they're super charming. Yeah. So you can have fun with it like that and just get people more involved that maybe wouldn't be as involved. Uh, mm-hmm. Obviously, if you're listening to this podcast, and if you're listening to the end of it, yeah. you've got a long commute. <laughs> <laughs> or uh or, or you really love animals yeah. and that's awesome and but we want to get people that just think animals are okay to really mm-hmm. love them and then right. f- want to know where they live and that's when you can say oh they live in the amazon and mm-hmm. then start that conversation about what's happening in the amazon and how they live in a small pocket and or things like that or if you have a friend that's anti-zoo we all have them mm-hmm. you know, there's it is what it is Maybe talk to them about this story. Without zoos, the, there would a thousand percent definitely not be any gold line tamarins. Right, they would have been right. wiped out before I was ever born. Right, it just helps Think start the conversation. Yeah, it would just it helps start the conversation, and that's where we really, you know, that's what drives us each each week. Yeah, to bring well, that's the information. How, I mean, and- if of course people don't have money to donate every week to all these different mm-hmm. organizations, you just pick and choose your favorite, and gold line tamarin probably will be up there because they're so yeah. stinking cute. Yeah, yeah, but. If not, just being, you can be conservation heroes by starting a conversation. Right, right. Or, you know, you can, for a cup of coffee a month, you can support us and we'll spend the money for you. So, yeah, <laughs> check it, yeah let check, us do the shopping. Yeah, let, uh, check <laughs> us out on Patreon. We appreciate it. We love our Patreon subscribers. And thank you for listening. It's each week, you know, we're going to keep doing this, bringing you new species from around the world and tell you their conservation stories. So, thank you. Thank you so much. Listen, learn, share. Join the movement at allcreaturespod.com.